Um, great. Well, I'm here to introduce uh, Spark Number Nine. We are a new type of market research that focuses on actual behavior, not on what people tell us about their behavior. And we're unusual in that we use advertising campaigns to answer questions about strategy, particularly as it relates to growth. So um, marketing today, increasingly online, as we're all very aware of. And you know, frankly, if you can't stop a thumb, um, you may not sell your product. And so we put a lot of focus on uh, creating ad campaigns um, to capture behavioral data in channels where people expect to find out about new products. Um, and the way we do that is that we use ads to represent distinctly different value propositions. So let's say we were launching a gardening app. We might uh, bring that to life in a couple of different ways. One that's very much about um, kind of a growth tracker and custom coaching. Another one that is uh, much more focused, let's say, on how we serve beginners. Same product but products are rich, right? They have many different product attributes. You have a split second to capture someone's attention. Which attribute do you choose? We come at that um, through testing and testing different product positions, different brand positions with ad campaigns to find that match between product and uh, customer. So it basically happens in three steps. Uh, we work with our clients to develop brand positions for products, whether they exist yet or not. Um, we spend a lot of time creating audience profiles so that we end up testing campaigns against discrete audiences with the idea of learning as much as we can about how different audiences respond to different brand positions. And on the right-hand side of this slide, um, we do a lot of analysis um, and really try to find that sweet spot between uh, product, uh, the way the product is positioned and uh, conveyed through creative and messaging, and then the audiences, who responds to what. And I'm gonna walk you through an example of what this looks like in a few slides. Um, our clients are both large and small. Um, we work with a lot of big companies, many of whom have a fantastic array of new product ideas, and they're completely paralyzed about which ones they should pursue and why. And so we help them de-risk the product development process by providing research that shows that uh, consumers really like this particular product and they're not that interested in this other concept. We also work with young companies, with startups who want to find product market fit um, and also de-risk their go-to-market strategies. Um, we are an unusual mix of a very creative team. We have a whole team of designers who can bring new products to life um, in many different ways. And then we have a team led by a guy who was a data scientist at Google for 10 years that's very analytical um, and very collaborative. So all of us are working very closely uh, together. Um, so. I'll spare you going through all of these questions, but basically we um, usually work on uh, new product concepts, um, sometimes kind of launching entirely new brands. But what we always leave our clients with is uh, this, a scalable customer acquisition model. So we're not just a market research firm because we're using ad campaigns. We are almost always able to leave our clients with road tested customer acquisition. Um, kind of four big deliverables, positioning the brand, finding those audiences that really respond to whatever is being offered, um, actual campaigns that work, and then a kind, kind of pulling it all together, an overall strategy, um, which often contributes to a business plan, business model development, and so on. Um, more recently, we have started testing pricing as kind of one of the later waves of the testing we do, um, which can also really help validate um, a business plan, whether you're going to corporate to ask for money for your new product, uh, or you know, whether you're a startup kind of uh, uh, pitching to investors. Okay, so what does this all look like? Let's say you were launching uh, a new life insurance brand, or maybe it's an existing life insurance brand and you're trying to target 
a younger audience like millennials. We're often asked by large companies, hey, can you help us figure out how to connect with millennials? So in a case like that, we might create some ads that look very traditional, as many life insurance companies do, um, but we might also test um, some different creative, different ways of positioning uh, a product that maybe are a little hipper looking uh, and cheeky even, maybe focus on pets or something cute. Again, really trying to think about how to um, position the product in a different way with millennials. So there might be a lot of uh, people at this fictional Riley Life Insurance Company um, who uh, wanna stick with the traditional and that's fine but we really let the data help drive the decision-making here. And so it, it has a wonderful way of cutting through politics in large companies because we end up being able to say, actually a picture of a dog did so much better in selling your life insurance product than you know, this very conservative looking man on the left. Um, what's really important though is defining the audiences. And we spend a lot of time honing audiences typically in platforms like Facebook and Instagram, which have a rich array of targeting data, sometimes in LinkedIn, if we're doing a B2B product. Um, but basically, we're, uh, we really um, kind of leverage a lot of the richness of information that is being collected about all of us um, to really help create discrete audiences that we can test against. And so our testing process kind of looks like this, where in this case, we've created three brand positions for growing an existing life insurance brand. We bring them to life with a couple of different types of creative. And the reason we do that is we never want the creative to be the reason that a brand position succeeded. We want uh, um, the position itself uh, to have some data behind it. And then we test all of the ads against all of the audiences. And in this example, there are three audiences. Uh, we do this several times and effectively what we're doing is we're starting at the top of the funnel, what makes somebody click in terms of brand position. And we work our way down to the bottom of the funnel over the course of several waves of testing. Sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four, if we end up testing pricing and so on. But we are using both traditional metrics that people are used to, things like click-through rates and so on. Um, but again, uh, really focusing eventually all the way down on conversion. What gets somebody not just to click and maybe give an email address and start to engage, uh, but what gets them to actually purchase the product? Um, we also are constantly fine tuning creative. So if we discover in wave one that a particular brand position resonated with um, a particular target audience, we riff on it because we really like to leave our uh, clients with uh, a portfolio of creative around a particular brand position uh, that works uh, to acquire new customers. And here's kind of another view um, of what this kind of heat map eventually looks like. We're really looking for this connection between audiences here on the left, you know, what, what does a first time home buying audience respond to in terms of brand position? Um, and so, you know, this is a fairly high level view of this, but we cut the data a lot of ways to really try to understand uh, what are the drivers of this connection uh, of product market fit. Um, our projects uh, are basically a consulting project. Um, they unfold over about 12 to 14 weeks, typically are organized in about five phases where we do have a sort of discovery uh, process up front, really trying to understand the landscape. Um, a lot of workshopping with the client to develop brand positions. Uh, we then handle the creative um, and testing usually takes four to five weeks. And the reason for that is we wanna catch people not only during the week, but all, also on weekends. And so our testing cycle is usually about a full week long um, and then some quick turnaround on analysis before we launch the next wave of testing. Um, a lot of times our clients will ask us to uh, implement, implement some of the results of testing. That's kind of our build phase. That could be optimizing costs, but oftentimes it's also um, creating the, the next step 
for example, okay, we got a whole bunch of people to give us an email address on a landing page as part of our testing. How do we now, thanks Michael, how do we now cultivate them um, with perhaps an email campaign um, and can we test that as well? Uh, I mentioned a little bit about our team. I sort of lead the strategy and synthesis side. Mike is our ex-Google guy who um, leads our analytics and Amanda leads our creative team of uh, designers. And, you know, I feel like we uh, compete a little bit probably on the market research side, but also on the consulting side. You know, there are many consulting firms who will come in and help you with new product development. I think, you know, what's different about us is that we have data. We have statistical validity around our results um, and we structure all of our tests to be sure that that's the case. So things are really validated um, in the real world by real humans who are clicking on ads that are real ads. Um, and so it's a, a very different approach, I think, to helping companies with go-to-market strategy. Great. Cool. Okay. There was um, my, my New York uh, speed delivery. Uh, so. You have now four minutes left for questions. Uh, does anybody want to either enter in the chat or raise uh, a question um, for Heather? Yeah, I, I have a question. Kevin. Um, Heather, that was fantastic. Thank you. I'm curious about um, your research methodology and are you using conscious-based research or are you using um, like implicit association testing or something that taps into the subconscious? Um, wow, super good question, and you sound far more sophisticated about uh, behavioral techniques than I am. Um, you know, we are literally um, using neither of those things, I don't think. I mean, ours is, uh, I would say, a very pragmatic approach to market research, which is leveraging a lot of the ways that, uh, you know, both consumers and business people sort of interact with new products, which tends to be through ads in mostly social media channels, right? Where we all spend probably far too much of our day. Um, but boy, it sounds like I could learn something from you, Kevin. So I'd love to maybe have an offline conversation. I'm sure I could learn a lot from you. That was a fantastic presentation. So yeah, you guys should definitely connect. Um, uh, Joy, you said you had a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, so one of the questions I had was, it sounds like you're using um, pay-per-click with landing pages as the data gathering. That Those are the platforms you're using, is that right? Uh, for the most part, yes. Sometimes there are some others, but that's sort of our primary approach. Okay, and then how do you know, um, and I'm, yeah, I'm wondering how you know if, it, well, if you're doing it exclusively through social media, but do you ever just use um, like Google search, yes. you know, just paper? So then how do you know who is falling into which of your targeted audiences? It's a really good question. I would say our general preference is um, to use social media because it's so much easier to define audiences, mm -hmm. not just in terms of demographics, but in terms of things like values and lifestyle. In fact, we, I, th I would say we have had some of our most successful testing when we have created audiences based on their values um, on a platform like you know, Facebook or Instagram. However, um, every situation is different and there are absolutely some instances when search is the right solution. Um, and that's because it's a product that we know people are looking for because they have a problem to solve. More recently, we've actually started doing both search and social in parallel. And um, you know, it's part of our own internal learning curve, kind of thinking about how they can be complementary in terms of helping us learn about where that connection is between um, basically content really and consumer. Okay. And Michael, I just had one more question. I'm sorry. Sure. Not into okay. um, so do you um, also use um, video with YouTube find my audience to do some of that kind of testing? No. So it's such a good question. You know, we've had so much success for, I don't know, the last few years. Um, 
you know, really leveraging social media that we have only just now really started to venture more into search. And you're absolutely right. Like we need to be in YouTube. I, I will say this past summer where there's been a Facebook boycott has been a big wake up call for us. Um, mm -hmm. Since we've had a bunch of clients who have respected that boycott, it means that we need to start diversifying our channels. And so um, it's a great question, Joy, and it's absolutely somewhere I need to invest um, in terms of some human resources um, over the upcoming months. Okay. Thanks a lot. It was that great. Was, Thank you so much. That was uh, pretty much it for the 15 minutes. Um, uh, JJ asked if you do work on products and or services, and I definitely, I think it's both, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and the example that uh, Heather gave was uh, insurance, so definitely services, and then she mentioned um, technology products and other types of products as well. All right, so we have, let's see, we have uh, 12, 13, 14 people. Uh, I'm gonna take away Heather, because she's already given an introduction, so 13 people. If we do two minutes each, that'll um, that'll take us pretty much to the end. So why don't we do two minutes? And I want to give Gary, actually Gary's on the upper left anyway. So um, if I go in order, it would be uh, Gary, then Audrey, then Joe. And um, uh, well, I'll time you each for two minutes. Uh, I'm gonna go into speaker view. And since I record this, you'll have a much bigger version of yourself speaking. So um, Gary, Take it away. Sounds good. Well, uh, great to see everybody. Um, we have a niche-based uh, SEO company. Um, we really focus on Fortune kind of 500 companies in the enterprise space. Um, we have a very kind of different approach to things. Um, we tracked how Google changed from a rules-based approach to artificial intelligence back in 2016. We basically, if you've go to our website, Edgy Labs, it looks like a technology blog or like TechCrunch. Long story short, for the last five years, we write six to eight articles every single day. We're testing those methodologies of how we compose content, using the right terminology and the right concepts to make sure that we can manage the pulse of Google's change for big business. And then once they're proven on ourselves, we bring that into the enterprise and we have clients like Toyota, Lexus, um, Zales, Caliber Collision and, and brands like that. So really a, a data science approach to driving organic traffic. It's all focused on organic, nothing paid um, from, from that aspect. And we typically live in the middle of the agency of record and the web development company. Uh, but this approach to, um, you know, kind of giving Google what it's looking for at scale uh, and has helped us build our own artificial intelligence to do that with some of the largest brands in the world and, and really show 20 to 40 percent growth year after year for, for our clients. So if anybody, you know, if those are the types of clients that you have in your wheelhouse, love to connect and kind of discuss more on maybe how we can help each other. And thank you for fitting me in, Michael. I appreciate it. I oh, bounce my, my pleasure. And the timing, the timing was good. Um, and uh, good luck with your, your next meeting. Okay. Um, Audrey, you are up. Great. Hi, everybody. Audrey Glovedictor, Glovedictor PL. I'm an attorney and I'm based in South Florida. However, my practice is a federal practice, so it doesn't matter where I am. I help businesses and clients nationwide. Um, I work with professionals who need to launch a legally compliant marketing campaign in English and Spanish, but lack the legal knowledge and how uh, the legal knowledge to attempt to avoid lawsuits for false advertising, IP infringement and privacy law violations. So I work with small and medium agencies and small and medium businesses and startups. Basically I work with people who can't afford the big firms <laughs> who need this help to be legally compliant. Um, I do work with um, business attorneys who are starting all the paperwork for businesses to start new businesses. But the problem is that they don't do the IP research to make sure that they can use the that name or that phrase or that logo that they want to use and then they launch their business and then they find that they're doing um they have ip infringement and so when i review a campaign um that's part of what i review as well 
I also want to make sure that if you're using whatever materials you've been using, a photo, a video, a music, um, that you have the IP clearance. And of course, if everybody's online, so your online presence must be legally compliant with privacy law issues, which every day get more and more complicated. And um, of course, on top of that, obviously advertising law, which is FTC law. I start with that and then I bring in what are the other federal laws agencies may be applicable to the service or the product being um, advertised. So it could be FDA, SEC, or just about any other agency. And then depending where your marketing campaign is going, then we look at the states as well to see if there's an issue there to um, deal with. Thank you very much, Audrey Clover Dictor, Clover Dictor PL. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, um, I have Joe and then Alex. So, uh, thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Joe Mag at Griffin Solutions is my company. Um, I, I'm an IT management consultant. Uh, I really hate it when I hear senior managers tell me they are not happy with their IT team. It doesn't have to be that way, and it shouldn't be that way. And I work with uh, with uh, with companies to build IT departments to get the job done every day. Um, you know, the way I do that is I bring senior management, line management, and staff together in a strategic planning process, and and through that process, establish clear and compelling priorities for IT, and help them address critical gaps across their people, processes, and technology involved in IT that get in the way of their priorities. Uh, so the companies I work with uh, are middle market, typically uh, 50 to 75 million at the bottom end, up to about uh, whatever, three, four, or 500 at the top end, 100 to 200 million is the sweet spot. Uh, typical sort of profile is the IT responsible party doesn't report to the CEO and isn't uh, sitting at the table when they're doing strategy. So uh, sort of corollary to that is that senior management sees IT as a service bureau for their department or division, not for the company as a whole. So each senior manager's folks are sending a list of top one, you know, five to 10, whatever, over the wall to IT. And now IT has got multiple lists of top whatever. And they're trying to please everybody. They end up pleasing nobody because they're thrashing. They're dealing with the crisis of the day. They're not acting in a strategic fashion for the company. So, you know, it's not going to be a technology, an actual technology company where IT is their business. This is going to be everybody else where IT is a support function. But again, it's not being seen as a support function for the company as a whole. And, and it's, just, it's a management problem. And there will be other problems that will crop up as, as part of that uh, scenario. But the core problem is this management problem of senior management is not looking at IT as a whole. IT is not part of their strategy. And, and things, you know, it's like they end off, a starting off a half a degree off of their, their heading uh, when they're flying out to their destination. And they end up just really far away from where they're supposed to be. So uh, you know, I've done this process uh, in multiple industries, uh, manufacturing, publishing, uh, nonprofit, government, you name it. Um, it's a, it's a well-worn methodology as it were for me. And also I do have IT, uh, an IT strategic management software that I built years ago. I don't sell it anymore, but I use it as part of my process. So I build a draft IT strategy in that tool and that's my facilitation tool to go and see your management. So very unique and, and uh, very effective in that fashion. Thank you. Okay. Um, we will go on to Alex, then Kevin, then Mark. Um, hey so <laughs> Alex, you're up. Hi, I'm Alexander Acker, but you could call me Alex. I'm the president, but not founder of Adventure House, a motion graphics uh, marketing uh, and web-based agency um, that's out of New York City, although we're now based out of Long Island. <laughs> um, so, um, we were founded in 1990. Um, I bought the, I worked with the company since about 2000. I bought the company from the two partners when we had like 25 employees, uh, streamline our services and our, our capabilities and expertise uh, of the staff uh, from 2011 till now. So I guess next year will be my 10th anniversary as the owner. And we went virtual in 2019. Um, so, which is perfectly timed for this pandemic. So, Adventure House, the name isn't a fun kids venue uh, that serves ice cream and slices, but it's an exciting marketing web and motion graphics agency. 
Um, I'll really focus on the motion graphics aspect for this two minutes. Uh, that's really been our uh, main focus over the last two years and has substantially and significantly grown since the pandemic even. Um, we, per we currently have about 20 plus motion graphic animated videos in progress um, in various phases. Um, the process for creative video, I wouldn't say it's based on necessarily on analytics and data, but it's based on a discovery process where we really fine tune what the client's needs are uh, to really focus the messaging and the visuals uh, to target uh, specific pain points. So you could really have something creative and fun, but it's underlying message and found, uh, foundation is based on strategic needs. Um, and we've made an entry into virtual reality over the last two years, creating a number of experiences um, that are now in progress. And our clients range from startups uh, to large financial companies. Uh, we work with them globally throughout US, Europe, and Latin America. So no matter if it's a fun video launching a new product or service, or in interviewing an infectious disease expert uh, whose lab is seeking a cure for COVID-19, um, um, or driving to Brooklyn to meet with a client. And actually, I lied. I haven't said I haven't been in the city since February. I guess I did drive to near the city. Um, I'm just trying to keep it very separate. But um, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> but yeah, but you know, if it's for a client who's building a really nice VR experience, I'll do it. Uh, All right, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta move on. And Alex, that was great. You wanna, one more word there? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for cutting you off. Trying to keep it down to two. I'll, I'll, I'll put myself back off of mute and put the, uh, the ringer near my, my uh, microphone. Um, so it would be Kevin, then Mark, then Joy. Uh, so Kevin, you are up. Hey, yeah, hey everyone, I'm uh, Kevin Perlmutter. Um, I uh, lead a company, I founded a company called Limbic Brand Evolution, and I am a brand and customer relationship strategist. And uh, the work that I do is to help businesses and brands focus on what makes them unique and desirable, uh, create stronger connections with their customers, um, and evolve in ways uh, where their business can grow and expand um, and create greater loyalty. All the work I do is focused on emotion and through the lens of how you want people to feel. Um, and what I'm doing for my clients is I'm helping them bring um, emotional insights into their strategic work that'll, that'll give them a competitive advantage. So it's emotional insights uh, for a competitive advantage. Um, I work with brand leaders, I work with CMOs, I work with founders of companies um, who are looking to evolve in these ways. That's all I got. Okay. You're on mute. Yeah, 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 I know. Sorry about that. You have a whole minute left. Anything yeah, in terms of... Um, it's all right. I like to keep it short and sweet and not... <laughs> so I, I, I'll give the time back. <laughs> all right. Wonderful. Okay. So uh, I said Kevin, then Mark, Joy, uh, and then Rich. So it uh, looks like Mark is up. Hi, I'm Mark Thiebel. Um Pro Strategy Advisors. Um, we work with clients that are um, private as well as uh, private equity groups and um, investment banks. Obviously, our private clients are interested in learning new markets, building partnerships. Obviously, the private equity groups are interested in growth through acquisition. That's what they do. Um, our approach is mainly market research, both quantitative and qualitative, and we use the qualitative to benchmark the quantitative because quite frankly, the quantitative is not always accurate. But what this eventually leads to is market trending, positioning, building segments. And that's often where we will end, but we occasionally will go a little further in build process um, and do CX, CRM and UX. And that's us. Thank you, Mark. You do have another minute or so. Anything else you want to add or best leads or anything along those lines? Well, I mean, for us, the, for me, the best leads from, from a corporate point of view are often, um, believe it or not, the professionals, because a lot of times the attorneys and the accountants have the ear 
of the presidents and you know the the board of directors and and they're the ones that often will convince somebody that they they've <clears throat> they're trending and they're not doing very well and they need to do something to step it up. Obviously, the private equity groups um, it needs to be someone that can make a decision on who they want to hire to determine whether they should buy the company or expand the company. All right, wonderful. Um, thank you very much. Let's see, that was Mark, uh, Joy, then Rich, then JJ. Um, so. Thank you. Yep, um, so I'm Joy. I'm a, um, an independent market research consultant. I've been independent for, um, it was just 22 years earlier this month. Um, which I can't believe, but um, so I work with um, startup to Fortune 100 clients. Um, I kind of have three models that I work off of. One is um, where I work with marketing consultants who are doing branding or whatever and need um, assistance on the research piece. Um, the other is where I take overflow from research agencies that are either looking for specific methodologies that um, I've worked with or just have a need um, for extra hands and eyes. Um, and um, then I work sometimes directly with clients. So, um, and I use both qualitative and quantitative techniques. Um, and, um, you know, I've used some of the newer qualitative, the digital um, types of methodologies to, um, to look at different problems that businesses are facing. And, you know, Heather, I think some of the language you used is some of the language I use in terms of, um, you know, de-risking um, where companies are going by research and also um, really empowering them to grow through having, you know, tangible insights. So that is it. Okay, thank you so much, Joy. Um, so market research, both qualitative and quantitative. Um, Rich Sobel, then J.J. Rosen, then Buddy Altus. Um, so Rich, you wanna take it away? Sure, hi, I'm Rich Sobel. Uh, I run a small consulting practice, Mercado Solutions. We are focused on uh, really helping companies transform and change how they approach their customers, whether that's uh, brand marketers who are looking to improve how they touch their customers, tying together their paid media, their CRM and own media, and their earned media, uh, really focused on data, technology, automation, uh, data science, and kind of improving the strategy on how uh, businesses approach their customers. So two thirds of my practice is focused on brands. The other third is split evenly between marketing and ad tech platforms that help service those brands in terms of improving their product and their go-to-market. And then the last batch is helping media companies adapt to the changing demands of the marketer uh, from a data perspective, from a process perspective, programmatic, automation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my ideal clients tend to be uh, companies in the second and third tier, uh, folks who, like I said, aren't, or aren't really necessarily willing to pay for the McKinsey's and the Bain's for the type of transformation work that I bring. Um, I deal generally with CMOs, chief customer officers, CROs, um, heads of sales, heads of marketing, heads of data, heads, heads of analytics, uh, heads of data science, so on and so forth. Okay, um, got 20 seconds left. Anything else you wanna add or? Um... Um, I'm based in New York and I have clients uh, all over the country as well as in Europe. Cool, thank you. Okay, let's move on. JJ, then Buddy, then Ling. Um, JJ, take it away. Hi, um, nice to meet you guys. I'm JJ Rosen, um, and I was from brand new to the, the group here. Um, uh, we have a company uh, here in Nashville called Atiba, and we are um, basically uh, computer nerds, computer geeks. Um, and so we've been in business since, uh, I guess, 1992. Uh, we have a few groups. We have our uh, web development, software development, mobile app, BI, basically our programming group. It's doing all kinds of software development, um, ranging from a small one-person startup to large enterprise places. Um, 
and so we're, we're coding away um, uh, all day. Uh, and then we also have our uh, network and IT slash cloud services group. And that's where we're doing um, a lot of hosting as well as um, uh, managed services, IT support, um, just anything related to the IT side. Um, and then we uh, thirdly have our technical project management group. And that is our group of project managers that are basically managing projects throughout our own stuff we're working on and specifically for clients. Um, and um, uh, we uh, uh, tend to uh, have uh, clients, like I said, all over the board um, uh, in the industry um, and with specifically with um, marketing and advertising type folks, we're often the, kind of the ones behind the scenes as a subcontractor, even sometimes uh, doing software development work or or partnering with someone who is better on the creative side. Uh, so uh, that's it. That's it for me. Thank you, JJ. And JJ, I think, was introduced by Heather. Is that right, Heather? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for that, Heather. And and certainly uh, to anybody uh, you know on the call and in the group, if you have other folks that you think would be good members, um, because they do work in the marketing, sales, and advertising space. Um, uh, or network in that space, uh, please, you know, introduce them to me. I'd be happy to talk to them and see if they'd be a good fit. So we're going to move on. That was JJ, Buddy, Lynn, and then Keith, and then me. So Buddy, take it away. Good morning. Um, Heather, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, I missed part of your presentation, but the part that I got was, was very interesting. My name is Buddy Altus, and I run uh, Bridgeton Advisors. We provide uh, e-commerce, innovation, and marketing and product development services to customers. Um, I really uh, focus on the technology, product, and business development areas for companies and uh, customers. Um, I've been at uh, Avis Budget Group for a long time, focusing on those areas in American Express. Also, in addition to uh, the travel industry, very focused on payment and um, financial services. So companies like that that um, need help in the e-commerce or API or partnership spaces where uh, we really provide a lot of uh, assistance. So um, nice to meet everybody and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Okay, thank you, buddy. Um, uh, best leads, you still have about 45 seconds. Best leads are companies that um, are in the place where the sales team and um, the partners don't really understand the technology that they need and um, need someone who can communicate and bridge that gap. So Joe, a lot of the stuff that you were talking about um, was uh, resonating for me. Um, so if I can help uh, you know, bring parties and communicate the product solutions and problems more easily, that's where I can add the most value. Wonderful, thank you so much. Okay, um, let's move on. We have Ling, then Keith, and then I will go. So Ling, you are up, take it away. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ling and I'm a paid, search, a paid social marketer. I have a company called Dex where I help uh, marketing professional decision makers to build really nice uh, presentation to communicate with their team or with their clients. Um, I uh, also offer an audit service where I'll go into a, a client's or a, a company's account and uh, audit opportunities and potential uh, change uh, that you can make to the account. Um, so, uh, I my ideal clients are uh, typically in a small, mid-sized uh, company. And, uh, and so, I'm glad to, to be here today. And, Glad to see some familiar faces, Heather, uh, Rich, Mark, Joy, uh, so yeah. And you. Uh, Ling, you mentioned audit, but I'm not sure everybody knows what, what types of things. It's, it's uh, paid 
paid search, right? Is that the focus where, where you do audit or is That's it? correct, yes. Yes, so a paid search audit audits typically uh, include, you know, auditing uh, keyword opportunities, auditing the ad copies that we're running, uh, account and campaign setting, and, you know, looking and looking at reviewing the audience that was selected. Uh, a lot of time, if the campaigns were fully built out, uh, there's always opportunities, uh, hidden opportunities that, that uh, you know, another person can reveal. Uh, not necessarily a better opportunity. It's just that it's just, it's just a third eye uh, looking into the account. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Keith Reynolds, and then I will go. Uh, Keith, let me reset the clock for you. Um, cancel. Take it away. Hey, everybody. How are you? Uh, Keith Reynolds. I have a company called Publio, and uh, we help companies. Uh, survive and thrive in today's content culture. Uh, I've been writing and producing websites and, and integrating uh, web communications uh, with companies marketing uh, since 1994. Wrote my first website in 1994. And uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I built a website for a startup I was with. Uh, we were reeling from the financial uh, debacle of 2008 and uh, taught myself WordPress and six months later I was asked to testify to Congress. Uh, I then built a, a website for Kodak called Chief Packaging Officer which was uh, a magazine that came out in 2015 and uh, in one year we filled the pipeline with uh, uh, 57 million dollars in uh, a new business um, opportunity and Kodak sold the division that we worked for, and one of the major negotiating points in the M&A deal was uh, the acquiring company wanted to buy the property, chief packaging officer. Uh, it's uh, now gone through a second acquisition, and it's still online. Uh, then in 2017, I did the same thing for a software company. The CMO has left, and their online uh, magazine, their digital magazine, is still online. So I help people... Uh, and businesses create sticky, um, um, massively successful um, web content. Uh, I, I do uh, market or I use market research and SEO research to come up with the opportunity. And then I have a seven step uh, program that I've developed in my book called The New Content Culture. And, and I'm building a, a consulting practice uh, and software company around the, the seven bucket methodology. Uh, and I love to partner with agencies and work with brands and help them succeed uh, with their lead generation using content. Wonderful. Thank you, Keith. And uh, I will give myself uh, uh, those examples, by the way, were great. And that's, I find that that's really helpful uh, for people when they, um, uh, when they introduce themselves or when they do the little pitch. To, if you can tell a short story that really sticks. Um, as Rochelle, who uh, is our presentation uh, coach, will tell you, you know, are you storytelling or boring telling? I'll try to tell a story. Uh, so my name is Michael Bendit, and uh, my company is called Software Development Resources. Um, as the name implies, I provide software development resources. So I represent about uh, 10 different boutique software teams. Uh, we do a lot of work in marketing um, and also for startups. Um, and uh, the marketing work, a lot of it comes from relationships with agencies. So uh, just like JJ Rosen's company, we focus on the technical side and we work with agencies who want to focus on the, on the creative side, on the advertising perhaps, on the strategy, but they don't necessarily have the in-house resources to do all of the coding. Um, actually, the best leads are those that are digital agencies, those that have some internal resources because they tend to understand the process and the, and the challenges better, but they often run out of resources. They don't have, or they don't have the right resources. Um, and then we work with startups. Um, I have uh, a few startups where we're building their first product uh, and other startups where we are taking over from uh, another team or a freelancer. Um, oftentimes startups begin with working with a freelancer, um, somebody's nephew or something like that, 
Uh, and then it only takes them so far. If the startup is successful, they either need to build out their own team, but more than likely they're going to go from a freelancer to a outsourced team uh, that's been around for a while and can put more resources behind the work than just one person can. Um, so best leads for me, I guess, are the digital um, uh, agencies, uh, marketing agencies, and uh, also anybody who's, who's got a startup that uh, is thinking about uh, building a software product and, uh, and need some help in figuring out where they can, who's, who's right for building that product. Uh, and because I represent 10 teams, um, I'm able to usually match them with, with the right set of capabilities. Okay, I'm going to switch back to the everybody mode. Um,